presentation. And um, I will try to talk about this topic in a way that uh, addresses the social or a social policy angle to address more. There are several, um, I would have, I would need more time, um, but I will try to give you a, a brief overview of the work that I have already done on this and, um, and then some thoughts on how asset manager capitalism relates to social policy in general and pension policy in particular. Um, so what is asset manager capitalism as I understand it? Um, at the very macro level or at the level of the uh, evolution of the financial system, um, there has been a relative decline of the banking sector uh, relative to the rise of oh, what I would call institu institutional capital pools. So financial institutions that are not banks, so-called non-bank financial institutions. And the largest of those are, and those include asset owners, meaning uh, pension funds, um, and also uh, insurers, they would also fall under asset owners, um, and asset managers. Uh, so the firms that manage assets on behalf of others for a fee, but don't, them, are not themselves the, benef uh, uh, the beneficial owners of those assets. Uh, the other macro dimension that I would like to highlight is that I, I see a, a shift in the function of the financial sector in the economy from uh, financing uh, economic activity and especially corporate investment towards, well, asset management. Uh, another word for this would be wealth preservation. The two functions always go together the financial sector always does both. Um, today in the class that I'm teaching he here this semester, we talked about balance sheets. And uh, well, from the perspective of financial institution, there's always the function of investment on, on the asset side of the balance sheet and the function of well uh, wealth preservation for, um, uh, for their customers on the liability side. So your bank deposit uh, is of course your wealth and that is on the liability side of, of, and the same is true for fund shares, for example. So a shift from financing to asset management. The driving force for financial intermediation is to a much larger extent than in the past, uh, not the corporation coming to a bank saying, I would like to, uh, get financing for this very large investment project here that costs $100 million. And it is increasingly the pension fund that comes to the asset manager and says, I would like you to manage these $100 million for me and I don't care how you invest them, uh, which is a very different dynamic. Of course they care, but uh, it's, it's not about, it's not, it, the actual real economy investment project is not the driving force of this. Now, we can look at the impact on the non-financial economy of the rise of asset manager capitalism. Uh, and there we can distinguish three spheres. One is the realm of the public corporation, meaning the uh, stock market listed corporation. And there I have um, done quite a bit of work on, on asset manager capitalism as a corporate governance regime. And, and I'll briefly talk about that. But then there is also the, the rest of the economy, which um, comprises private companies. I should call them companies here, not corporations. Um, and there one can observe a financialization of the ownership model for um, private companies. Um, so that's about private equity buying companies, private equity asset managers buying companies. And also, um, well, there is also the non-corporate economy or what one could in very generic terms describe as the social infrastructure, which includes health and care facilities, schools, universities, and housing, of course. Um, and this non-corporate part of the economy is also increasingly, um, let's say a target for investment um, by 
institutional investors and their asset managers. So we will talk about the second part um, towards in the second uh, part of the talk when we talk uh, and throughout there is a certain focus on what drives the growth of asset manager capitalism and that is what where I really see the most important a very important link to social policy because it's really two things um, simply put one is wealth inequality the more wealth inequality there is the more um, uh, wealth is uh, with households or individuals very wealthy ones that invest in financial assets whereas for most of the middle class if they have a major asset it's usually their portfolio is dominated by their home the house they live in which doesn't require much financial intermediation once you've paid off your mortgage um, whereas uh, millionaires and, and billionaires, of course, um, invest much more in financial assets that requires asset management. And the second driving force is social policy in general, um, but pension policy in particular. A pay-as-you-go pension system requires no financial intermediation, whereas a fully funded pension system requires very large amounts of financial intermediation. So pay as you go, uh, we'll talk about this um, in a minute. All right. So what about asset manager capitalism as a corporate governance regime? Um, so uh, I would have um, been more, more fluent probably had I had my presenter's view here, but uh, due to Zoom, Zoom issues, uh, I don't, but I, I still can explain uh, this investment chain to you. Um, so this is what I uh, would call the equity investment chain. Uh, you have um, the issuers of corporate stocks on the right-hand side, corporations, and you have the beneficial owners uh, that are at the end of the uh, investment chain, that the shareholders uh, or, or the beneficial owners who, who are the ultimate recipients of um, well, uh, share price gains and dividends. But in between uh, today, there are two other groups of institutional capital pools. One are uh, the institutional investors, uh, which includes pension funds, university endowments, sovereign wealth funds. Um, and one could also add insurers here. Um, that pool capital from many households to invest them in financial assets. Um, and uh, over the last yeah, 30, 40 years, a second layer has been at institutional layer has been added to this investment chain. And these are our asset managers, which um, includes uh, plain vanilla mutual funds. So just uh, funds that invest in bonds and equities but also so-called alternative asset managers, such as hedge funds and private equity funds. And we'll talk about those later. For the corporate governance story uh, that we're talking about in the next five minutes, what we're talking about is really the providers uh, of mutual funds and of exchange traded funds or ETFs. So BlackRock is the largest of these companies and most of you will have probably heard of it. And then there are many others. Vanguard, State Street are the next two biggest ones. And um, as you can see, um, these firms manage capital uh, for these upstream uh, asset owners by investing them uh, here in the assets emitted by the corporate sector. The returns flow back in this direction. And then these intermediaries are paid fees either from by those institutional investors, or you can also, of course, directly as an individual uh, purchase shares in a mutual fund or in an ETF, and then you would pay the fees directly to those asset managers. There are a variety of other um, intermediaries and consultants in this universe, but they don't need to concern us here. Now, <clears throat> Both when we talk about these plain vanilla, vanilla mutual funds and ETF providers, uh, and when we talk about hedge funds and private equity later, 
it is very interesting to look at the importance of pension capital for the growth of this asset management sector. Um, and I've done quite a bit of digging to uh, be able to show you this. So here we have on, on the left-hand side, the rise of retirement assets in the United States. The biggest pot of pension assets, of course, is in the US uh, of like uh, 35 trillion US dollars, um, which come from various types of uh, retirement uh, schemes and plans. Uh, the details, we don't need to look at the details now. Then here we have total mutual fund assets, which are lower than total uh, retirement assets, but also very high above $25 trillion. And then here we can see the share of mutual fund assets that are retirement assets. So of those $25 trillion uh, invested via mutual funds, actually, uh, oh, sorry, um, more than 45% uh, are retirement assets. So almost 50% of the business of these asset managers is accounted for um, by retirement assets. Um, so, and uh, remember those, that 50% number. Now, why does all this um, matter? Uh, from a corporate governance perspective. Here you can see the ownership structure of US corporate equity since 1945. Uh, should we pause? Oh, some movements of the camera there. <laughs> so. um, Is this better, people in the room? Much better. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, people were struggling sorry. to see the slides previously. Apologies. <laughs> um, sorry. Yeah, I mean, these are very small. I mean, you will not be able, I think, to see a lot from in the back there. Yeah, maybe not from the back of the room. <laughs> maybe you can move closer if that's allowed. Do it on Zoom as well. So. Oh, okay. Yeah, of course. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, Don't worry about it. <laughs> um, all right. The, you see the U.S. corporate equity ownership structure since 1945 in the United States, and what you can see, uh, basically, in mid-century. Uh, all corporate equity was held, pretty much all of it was held by households. There was very little intermediation. The investment chain was short. There was almost nothing in the middle. But then starting in the 1960s, 70s uh, and 80s, you had a steady accelerating growth of uh, especially public and private pension funds. Um, so, um, it's the, this category here and then the green one here. Um, and also, of course, other uh, intermediaries, mutual funds and insurers. In 1985 um, was the peak of the share of corporate equities that was held directly by pension funds, 27% of all corporate equity. And this includes the equity of non-listed corporations here. So also corporations that are not list listed on the stock exchange are, are in this data. There's no way of separating them out. And uh, then since then, the share of uh, corporate equity held by pension funds direct, at that time in, in the 80s, 90s, pension funds were the most powerful investors uh, in the US and really worldwide. Um, they drove the corporate governance agenda, corporate governance reforms and the rise of the shareholder value model, which I would ideally like to talk a lot more about, um, but there's no, no time today, maybe in the discussion later, uh, was really driven by the corporate governance activism of pension funds. Since then, their share has declined. And this is not because their size has declined, as you can see in the left-hand panel here, um, you know, that has continued to really rise very fast, but because increasingly these pension funds have invested via the yellow part here and also some other actors, so via mutual funds and in recent years, especially via um, exchange traded funds, which has been a very fast growing segment. Um, and so today we are in a uh, situation where 
22% uh, of, no, the, the big three asset managers, BlackRock, State Street, and Vanguard in 2018 um, already held 22% of the equity of the average firm in the S&P 500, which is just the main stock index in the US. <clears throat> so they held almost as much as all the pension funds together in 1985. Uh, and is, this is a very significant share, which gives these firms a lot of power in corporate governance. Um, and to understand or uh, to explain why I think we can talk about asset manager capitalism as a distinct corporate governance regime, uh, I sho I'm showing you this uh, table, which um, shows four corporate governance regimes that um, represent basically, you can read this from left to right as a timeline. Um, so, uh, and here in the first column, you have the four most important hallmarks of each corporate governance regime and the names of these regimes uh, that I would give them and that I mostly take from the literature um, are down here in the bottom row. Um, this is all explained in greater detail in, in this chapter, which you can uh, find online, um, um, open access. So, we can't go uh, through all of this in detail, but uh, the main point of interest is that as compared to this post-war situation in which shareholders were just households, the concentration of share ownership has increased massively uh, from very low to medium with these pension funds to very high. So the top three hold 22%, 25% uh, of, of outstanding shares today. Um, which means that whereas shareholders, the individual shareholders used to be weak and only had the option to sell their shares in order to make you know, their preferences heard, um, exit in the terminology uh, of exit and voice. Um, pension funds were in a kind of sweet spot. They had both. They were big enough for their voice to be heard in corporate governance. They you know, owned 0.5%, 1%. Uh, of the stock of any given corporation, the big ones. So they were could be heard, but they were small enough that they could also realistically sell their investments in any individual corporation. Whereas today we're in a very different world where uh, potentially these largest asset managers are very strong, 10% of the vote in the case of BlackRock and Vanguard um, uh, gets them very close to actual control over, or at least they are often the swing swing uh, vote in uh, um, annual meet shareholder meetings. Um, but they do not have a realistic exit option. They can't just go and sell their investment in, uh, for example, when there was a the Volkswagen scandal in Germany. BlackRock could not just have uh, gone and sold its uh, investments in Volkswagen for two reasons. One, it was it, these investments are simply too large. You cannot just dump 6% uh, or 7% of the stock of one of the largest uh, corporations in the world uh, that would crash the stock price and you would take quite big losses on the later uh, uh, shares that you sell. You can't sell uh, all of them at the same time. Uh, and second, because most of this money is invested via index funds. So they just replicate the German stock index, DAX, and uh, Volkswagen accounts for a certain percentage of that index, and therefore BlackRock's uh, uh, Germany index funds are invested in that company with a certain share in order to replicate that. And so for both reasons, there is very little exit option. Uh, at the same time, we have uh, uh, what, what, so this configuration that uh, the strongest shareholders are quite, the, the biggest shareholders are quite powerful in corporate governance is not so different from uh, a period that is best described as finance capitalism, going back to the writings of uh, Rudolf Hilferding and others about the 
Germany, G German and US corporate governance around 1900. Basically the banks at the time were what the asset managers are today, uh, ex exercising quite strong control in the corporate economy, um, mainly because they were uh, lenders, but also uh, because they were represented on corporate boards uh, and so on and so forth. Um, but what is really different from today is the extremely high uh, degree of diversification of these asset managers. BlackRock doesn't just hold shares in any, in a selection of companies, um, but in basically all large publicly listed companies because um, their main business model is to invest via index funds. And so the uh, investment is spread out over uh, all companies in, in the index. And there are many ind indices, but there are also many index funds. And so BlackRock holds shares in literally tens of thousands of companies worldwide. Um, all right, I would like to talk more about this, but I think we have to really uh, move much faster now. Um, what does this mean for corporate governance? I would say let's talk about this during the Q&A. Uh, there is a promise of what is called universal ownership, which is that in theory, diversified shareholders should internalize all negative externalities that arise from the conduct of individual corporations. Think carbon emissions. Uh, so you know, to the extent that a few companies' carbon emissions doom uh, the planet, a shareholder that is invested in the entire planet should do something uh, to reduce uh, those emissions from those few companies in their portfolio in order to safeguard the value of the rest of their portfolio. So BlackRock is a giant social planetary planner, uh, if you will. Um, the the problem is that in practice, there are all kinds of conflicts of interest, which I've listed here and which I don't have time right now to go through, but we can talk about them maybe later if you're interested. Um, but for all kinds of reasons, somehow BlackRock has not yet emerged as a militant decarbonizing force. <clears throat> okay, now just uh, more briefly, um, on the other part that I've uh, written less about, but that we should talk about also here. Uh, so the footprint of asset manager capitalism in the private, uh, in the non-publicly, in, in the sphere of private companies and also in the sphere of the non-corporate economy. And here, uh, my two uh, main examples are the financialization of health and care, uh, which um, Christoph Schäuplein has uh, written very interesting things about the um, uh, activities of private equity funds in the German uh, uh, care sector in particular. Um, I've written a small uh, uh, article a couple of years ago with uh, Philippa Siegel Glöckner about the financial, about private equity and care in Germany also. And then uh, there is this extremely interesting report by Daniela Gabor and Sebastian Kohl from uh, January uh, about the financialization of housing in Europe, where they use um, a lot of uh, data to document the rise of institutional investment in residential real estate. So these are just examples for um, a tendency that we can observe of rendering investable for institutional investors parts of the economy that um, were often in the past not even privatized, let alone financialized, right? Um, so this is a big, big change really. And of course there is lots of resistance, especially against, um, especially in Berlin uh, at the moment against, against this. But what I just want to point out or to show you is again, the importance of pension retirement capital uh, for the power and influence of hedge funds and private equity funds. And, and this is especially private equity, actually this story here. Um, hedge funds play a bigger role in, in maybe uh, yeah, 
the corporate economy and also in maybe commodities trade uh, expect expect some hedge fund uh, profits and losses uh, in the near future from commodity speculation. Um, so I've already shown you the growth of retirement assets, uh, the importance for the growth of the mutual fund sector, but the same can be said, especially over the last 25 years for the alternative asset managers. This is when pension funds everywhere, and again, first in the US have moved into this uh, sector. And um, there is kind of a, an optimistic view of this development and a pessimistic view. Um, the optimistic view, which I re highly recommend this book by David Weber is that yes, pension funds have moved into private equity, thereby sort of investing in investment models that uh, do actively do damage to you know, the, the workers that are the uh, ultimate beneficiaries of these uh, pension funds, for example, by, by privatizing uh, public services and so on. Um, but pension funds have learned about this problem and uh, are trying to um, uh, push their asset managers to not do certain things or to do other things. And uh, actually, labor's capital can be a weapon in the hands of labor in the same way that organizing and the strike can be uh, a weapon in the hands of labor. So that's the optimistic view. Um, but then there is also a pessimistic view, which uh, I have recently argued in, in, in this paper put, shown here at the bottom, which if I, when I look at the history of pension fund investment in the US, and again, you have a timeline that you can read from left to right, you can observe, and I'm not the only one, of course, to say that there's a big literature cited in the paper. Uh, my, my, my point or my contribution is what I would highlight is this latest push towards um, uh, the most, let's say, aggressive and even predatory uh, forms of investment via private equity uh, that is a big trend for pension funds. Pension funds, uh, and, and the reason for this financialization is usually always the same. At some point, the returns pension funds are making fall short of what they think they need in order to fund their long-term liabilities to pensioners. So there's always a good reason to invest you know, in progressively more higher risk investments. And um, today they do that by going into the highest risk ones. And I'll just put this here. Um, uh, wait, no, we can come back to this. Just, uh, I want to show you this. This is the latest data I found. Uh, what do, who, who are the, who is the investor base of hedge funds and private equity funds? Uh, the same analysis that I showed you earlier for uh, mutual funds. And this is a little bit, um, this is for the US again, but that's basically where the entire hedge fund and private equity fund industry is located since 2013. Um, you can't see very much, but if I try to single out these, let's say, uh, nonprofits, sovereign wealth funds, and then um, public and private pension funds. So let's say non-capitalist, these are not capitalist enterprises like some of the other ones, right? Uh, and these are also not uh, rich households that are just uh, trying to you know, uh, get the highest return on the sale savings, but more or less like um, entities that serve a public function, if you will. And again, their share uh, or they account for almost 50% of the asset base of, of hedge funds and, and private equity, which I, when I first uh, saw this, I, I found it quite stunning. Um, so this is just something, whenever you, you talk about, or there's talk about how to design a pension system, and of course, funded pensions are always very contested. This is one aspect of social policy that I think is often under 
appreciated and under discussed. This is a very, uh, the uh, role of pension funds as a driver of pension uh, financialization um, is, is uh, the take home message here at the end of, of the talk. Look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.